Um, so we have uh, three panelists, as your program indicates, and I won't read their or, or give you much on their biography since it's all um, set forth uh, in your program um, and beautifully said, too. Um, Abe Cable, uh, Doug Cummings, and Mirit uh, Ayao Cohen. And uh, they will speak in that order for about 15 minutes. And uh, then we'll have a period uh, of questions, comments, and then questions. And uh, with that, uh, I call on first person alphabetically, Dave. <laughs> Okay, well, it's uh, <clears throat> wonderful to be here, and I, uh, I really couldn't think more of uh, Andrew's book in terms of it being a comprehensive, uh, even-handed account of crowdfunding full of sensible proposals. So um, I was a little stumped on what I was supposed to say about it, uh, given all that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get at the topic from a slightly different angle, which is I'm going to uh, compare this phenomenon of crowdfunding to um, Robinhood uh, online trading app, which is another area where we've heard a lot about democratized stock markets. And I think through the comparing and contrasting, we can sort of end up with some interesting insights. Uh, so. Uh, to me, um, when you think about Robinhood, um, it, it, is, it is somewhat useful to, uh, for a moment, sort of put aside some of the controversy of uh, hurting episodes with GameStop or payment for order flow or, or a lot of the things that you may, you may read about and to just think about it um, first as a, as a triumph in product design, marketing, and branding. And the reason I say that is that um, it is not a new idea to decide that everyone should be able to own stock. And I would say that whole areas of um, securities law could be explained by trying to make securities markets hospitable to everyday retail investors. And um, the industry itself has um, tried throughout time to try to make owning stock more accessible. So what's up on the screen right now is a story about a New York Stock Exchange campaign in the early 20th century uh, called the Own Your Share campaign, whose goal was mass stock ownership. And the idea was that everybody ought to own a little bit um, of corporate America. Um, and the fact of the matter is, um, it's kind of slow going. I, I would say there was something of a modest start to it um, with the uh, sort of pioneering discount brokers like Charles Schwab um, that arose in part from um, probably easing some um, anti-competitive pricing by the Wall Street firms. Um, so there was something of a regulatory impetus to being able to trade for uh, five bucks instead of 60. Um, and there were, of course, um, online portals for Charles Schwab and E-Trade and Ameritrade and all those for a while. But they were really different, I think, in scope and character from what we saw with Robinhood. And to sort of put a fine point on it, this is just a snapshot from Robinhood's IPO prospectus. And by the time of their IPO, they had almost 18 million active users, and they uh, claimed that over half of them were owning stock for the first times in their lives, right? So, th so this one product brought eight, you know, uh, eight, nine million people into the stock market, um, and, and it, wasn't, it, it wasn't a result of some sort of regulatory easing or change or anything like that. Um, what I would say it was, was uh, at least in part, just like a really snappy app. And um, it, it, it's, it's easy to sort of downplay that aspect of it, but um, the Robinhood um, mobile app uh, really is different from what was available even at discount brokerages um, at the time and now. Um, the, the app came about in an age when, when the field of user design or UX design had really sort of come of age. And um, there are sort of noticeable 
principles of design at work in the app, like reducing the amount of information, information minimalism. So, so you could you know, get 150 different charts and graphs on your Charles Schwab account, and you can get like five on um, Robinhood. And that doesn't sound good, but the fact of the matter is it makes it viable to use on an app, which is kind of helpful for people using it more. And it's also just avoids various types of information um, overload. Uh, famously, the app incorporated all sorts of different gamification techniques. So you got the very controversial burst of confetti when you traded your, your first stock that sort of induced people to want to use the app uh, more and more and more. It's populated with all sorts of um, lists of like our top movers for the day that people seem to um, have a real interest in, in following. And so all of these things just made it, um, uh, in the words of UX design, delightful to use. And that word is kind of UX design jargon and it shows up like a million times in the IAPO prospectus for Robinhood. So, so in part, I think what we have is um, a, a sort of technological breakthrough, not in a sort of high tech way, but in a sort of application of state of the art design principles to sort of an old application. And people loved it. Um, I also think it is worth taking seriously that there is a kind of um, ideology behind Robinhood, right? That name is not um, a, a thoughtless moniker. It's the idea is that there was something um, um, that was supposed to sort of fix capitalism and take from the rich and empower everyday people. And, and this, this comes through in the origin story of Robinhood where uh, the founders claim that they were, you know, in their big skyscraper at their sort of soulless finance job. And they looked down on the street and they saw the Occupy Wall Street um, uh, protests and they decided that, you know, they wanted to bring Wall Street to, to those to those people. And people seem to find this energizing. I mean, when you, when you look on like the Reddit boards that um, caused some of the controversies in the in the game stock um, run up, you, you, you see very much this sort of ethos at work. I mean, it's why people are investing to some extent. Okay, so um, to this we could of course add that they um, dropped uh, their uh, commissions down to zero through somewhat controversial um, economic arrangements, but honestly everybody did that and still IPO and still Robinhood was the, the app that everyone wanted to use. Okay, so, so what do I think of Robinhood? Um, um, I'll give you the sort of quick version of it um, and, and uh, from some prior work. I mean, I do think that there is something worthwhile in having people own stock. My grandmother bought me shares of stock when I was 12 years old and I still like have the actual share certificates. And we looked in the newspaper at what the stock was doing and that was learning through doing and, and that was extremely valuable. And I think there's absolutely something important there with people owning stock. I also think people just like it. And, and, and you know what, that, that matters. They enjoy using the app and we live in a world where uh, literal gambling is uh, legal in most states and there is some point at which we ought to just uh, sort of consider the fact that this seems to be an enjoyable experience to some people and um, um, perhaps we shouldn't stamp it, stamp it out altogether. Um, on the other hand, I, I have serious reservations really about Robinhood itself. Um, when you look at the investing activity there, there are some signs of, let's just call it some suboptimal um, investment uh, techniques from conventional financial planning perspectives. Um, people tend to chase particular stocks because they're on the top mover list. There's, there's demonstrated history of people herding into stocks, and that's associated with lower returns. Um, we also shouldn't just think about people buying, you know, a couple shares of GE stock and, and, and watching it grow over the years. A lot of what's going on is trading in complex options, things called like the iron condor, and they have all sorts of crazy names, and, and they're complex and they're hard to understand, um, and they're available right on the app. Um, there's also um, a, a pretty major segment of Robinhood where people are trading crypto assets that, that I would venture they don't, they don't fully understand. Um, Robinhood also just um, was kind of a move fast and break it, uh, break things kind of start up and had some really fairly egregious um, compliance violations early in its history um, that, that are, that are um, I think, sort of troubling. 
And then this is a point that I want to emphasize a little, a little bit here, which is that um, if you actually look at what most people are doing on Robinhood, it is um, a few hundred bucks of stock and it's not um, so much buying and selling. So if you look at just the median Robinhood user, um, they're doing something that um, um, is, is not sort of of major concern. But it's clear that you couldn't make uh, an IPO worthy business out of those users. And so where they make their money is on crypto and complex option trades and on a group of, I would just characterize them as compulsive super users who are trading all the time, and when Massachusetts security regulators brought an action against Robinhood, um, they um, had examples of you know, Massachusetts residents who had made trades at sort of alarming frequency. So, um, in a way, we, you know, we have these beneficial um, aspects of Robinhood, and I think that's um, worth keeping in mind that there's that there's something that there's something good going on but in a sense it's financed on the back of the compulsive super users trading crypto and complex options and I think we ought to like pause on that for a minute um, in my uh, prior research on Robinhood I had some ideas about how we could try to um, uh, preserve what's good and, and limit what's bad. And that's not especially relevant for today. So I'll spare you those details. And I'll move on to now comparing that picture of democratized stock ownership to crowdfunding and see what, what, what pops up from the comparison. Um, okay, the first thing I'd like to say is I also think that you can view the current success of crowdfunding as being a technological breakthrough. And I say that in part because there were efforts to use the internet to match buyers and sellers of startup stock for a long time. So what's relevant for this um, law review citation is that the article's written in 1998. And at that time, the SEC on an ad hoc basis had actually been quite accommodating to different economic development groups that wanted to create electronic bulletin boards where people could post plans for startups and people could be matched with local investors. And they were also accommodating to registered broker dealers starting websites that would vet investors for accredited investor status and then would match, offer them um, uh, startup investments. So, so the SEC was sort of dipping its toes in this area um, in, on a limited basis for a long time. And it just didn't take off. And I think you can sort of appreciate that if you think about what your computer screen looked like in 1995, it just wasn't a very compelling experience. And I think if you turn today, so this is a snapshot from WeFunder, you see something that's really quite engaging. And so across the top, you can click on different sort of affinity groups that might interest you and they'll serve you up with lots of offerings um, in, those, in those areas. Um, it's very social. People tend to have their little pictures and their names and their, and their profiles and, and you interact with people in that way. There's also a, a healthy little bit of drama and FOMO with the, oh my gosh, the future of coffee is almost sold out. So I better <laughs> click, I better click on it right now. Um, and also when you do click on a company, it's great. You have a video that you watch. There's like an early bird special for early investors. You can comment and ask questions. And the whole thing is, would have been, uh, I think, hard to even imagine in 1995 looking at your electronic bulletin board, right? So this is a really great experience. And, and, and you know, if people would rather, I don't know, put off their new car for a year and instead sit in their living room and put on their Patagonia vest and play VC for the day. Um, I, I have more power to them. That sounds actually fun to me. So um, I, I think there's there's definitely something here that's that's worthwhile. Um, I would also say uh, there is this sort of ideological branding part. This actually comes from the We We Funder website. So you see the crowd all wanting to crowdfund, but there's these bad laws in the way, and it's so sad for the entrepreneurs. And We Funder associates itself with crowdfunding as a movement, right? You do this and you're part of all those, all those people. Like you're part of something that's changing society. They say in various places that their goal is to fix capitalism, they're a benefit corporation uh, and, and all those things. And so if you doubt me that there's similarities to Robin Hood, here's my gotcha slide. We're building the Robin Hood for pre-IPO startups and everyone should angel invest $100. That comes right from, right from WeFunder. So there, there's certainly, we're in a, we're in a similar atmosphere, and, and I think you can think of these as all being a part of a similar 
development um, or, or movement or breakthrough or whatever you want to call it. I would say I feel better, a lot better, about crowdfunding than Robinhood, and I'll give you the reasons why. Um, I think the same pros basically apply, um, but the one that I would add that is significant is um, the inclusiveness from the standpoint of who can raise money, the company side inclusiveness, um, because Silicon Valley is just famously, demonstrably clubby. And this is a far more open system, geographically, racially, in terms of gender, whatever um, way you want to slice and dice it. Um, this is really um, uh, available to people, even in a world where the top sites are, um, are, are doing some screening and gatekeeping. So I think there's, there's something more here, uh, even, even better. Um, I, I will say, um, I, I do, uh, would first say, um, what you won't see on my pro side is we are sharing the benefits of the entrepreneurial economy with everybody. Because my personal opinion is that if you have a couple thousand dollars to spare, you should buy index funds, or I bonds from the US Treasury. And that none of this really has, I think, a serious role in any kind of financial future of any, of any person. Not to say that you couldn't hit, but everything we're learning about venture capital, at least, and we can assume somewhat similar dynamics here, is the power law and is the idea that very few companies create most of the returns in this sector and that the smart way to invest is to be a limited partner investing in a bunch of different venture capital funds that invest in a bunch of different companies and you get sort of massive amounts of diversification that way or significant amounts, I should say. That's not present, that's not present here. Um, so, so I think we need to be cautious about it. And I also think that there is a question in my mind about sort of exactly how the business models are working and exactly what the users are doing and whether the sort of averages and medians, which make it sound like sort of small potatoes, are true or whether there's some group of people who are sort of compulsively hitting the button and sort of investing in everything. And I, and I honestly don't know the answer, but I feel different about the whole thing if, 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 it, if it resembles Robin Hood in some respect. So um, if, in my mind, the most important feature of any regulatory system here would be the investor cap. And it can take different forms, but to just cut right to the heart of the matter and to limit the amount that a person can invest through crowdfunding to sort of contain the damage if there is any, and to just um, 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 put a cap on individual losses would seem to me a good cornerstone of any regulatory system. And from there, I'm fairly comfortable letting the people on the ground figure out what works and what's, what's compelling. Um, but but I, would, I would recommend that that one feature be prominent. Um, and, and I think Professor Schwartz has um, um, uh, uh, in, endorsed in a, in a sort of qualified sense um, that aspect of the regulatory feature and has also pointed out some fairly significant flaws in the way that it works right now in regulation CF, which I don't, I don't think is, I think is a little bit clumsily done. But so um, uh, the bottom line is crowdfunding better than Robinhood, keep the investor caps. All right. I could do an hour of each. Any questions? I think we'll do questions after each speaker. If you, if you have any, um, now would be the time. Okay. We'll have a mic come up. Yes. Thank you. I don't know if I should stand or not, but uh, my name is Seth. I'm a former student here. You mentioned towards the end that one of the wise ways to go about investing is to be an LP and like with a VC or whoever. Um, what, is that possible for people to? Just become an LP in various different funds now. Yeah, um, opening new doors here by allowing the direct investment, or I'm just curious about that. So, I mean, I think I could give sort of a cute answer, which is there are some investment vehicles that are publicly traded that invest in venture capital funds, but they're fairly minor part of the landscape, and I'm not sure they're that great either. So, the spirit in which I meant that was that if you have the luxury of, of being an institutional investor, then startup investing is the way to go. And if you don't, you should view it as an enjoyable experience rather than part of a financial plan. Yeah.
Thank you. So my question is, are there any additional actions beyond investor caps that can be taken so that uh, crowdfunding apps avoid the exploitations of super users like Robinhood uh, while holding true to, to democratizing access to investing in startups and the, the, liberal, the liberal, liberalization of these markets in general? Yeah, I mean, I have to say that the, the policy the Schwartz policy prescription all sounds pretty good to me. Um, the idea of focusing on the um, mechanics of the offering. So, so you know, when does a funding go through? Uh, what's the minimum funding amount? Um, those types of those types of actions, um, issuer limits, et cetera. Um, I think all uh, combine to. Um, to uh, sort of contain the damage, and I and I sort of share the impulse um, as well that the 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 instinct of securities law is to is to try to make the investment safe in some way, and that's either through like separating who's sophisticated or not, which we do very clumsily through accredited investor status, but it's it's some sort of effort at that, um, or through disclosure, right? So if there's information gaps, let's fill the information gaps. And I'm just highly skeptical that that stuff matters. And, and particularly when it comes to what I see on WeFunder, I don't think that the pros are valuing those types of opportunities on the basis of historical financial information. And that tends to be the biggest pain point in the mandated disclosure. So I, I just don't think that they are, I don't think the mandatory disclosure currently is providing the types of information that actually matter, and so um, so I would I would focus on things like um, issuer limits, the, the regulating the, the terms of the offering, making sure offerings don't go through when they've only raised five thousand um, dollars, and but investor caps would really to me be the same phrase. I, I so I'll just say I, my solution to Robinhood was also that we ought to create a sort of open space for apps like this for small accounts. So if you have an account under a thousand dollars then all sorts of regulatory concerns that Robinhood might have around whether it's making recommendations and whether it's accurately screening people for sophistication so they can trade options, all sorts of regulatory questions that loom over Robinhood, I would personally say, well, let's just give them sort of a pass on all of that and sort of a clear path to doing what they do that people seem to enjoy, but let's only give them that safe harbor for small accounts so that people aren't um, harmed in major ways. And so I really think the caps are kind of a nice, a nice place to focus investor protection. We have a question over here. Yeah. So uh, I want to follow up on that question um, regarding information asymmetries. And mm -hmm. Andrew was talking about it in his book. Um, perhaps the, when you're comparing Robinhood and crowdfunding, um, some of what Andrew is saying is that the benefits of crowdfunding is that we have those forums where people can talk about the companies, they can share some information. Um, how is that compared to Robinhood and, and how inside information is being monitored there, where, um, whereas in, in, in crowdfunding it's almost welcomed and you know, people are um, providing information or yeah. uh, asking questions, getting their information um, asymmetries kind of more balanced. I mean, I, I would sort of plead ignorance on what types of message board chat features there are on Robinhood. I, I, I just don't recall. But I can tell you where that is going on is on Reddit and other sort of external discussion forums. And lots of it's going on. And I don't know, my, my suspicion is that it's not like super great information. Um, but, um, but it's information, I suppose. Yeah. One more question. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for this. Um, I really appreciate your analysis of Robin Hood. Um, I, you mentioned Occupy Wall Street. I wrote a book on Occupy Wall Street. So people used to ask me during the, the GameStop thing, isn't this just like Occupy Wall Street? Um, but of course, they weren't feeding people in the streets and things like that. <laughs> um, and, and that kind of, you know, the kind of behaviors that it fed, you know, I think are really <clears throat> interesting to look at. Um, you know, one question I have about this is, is, is about the possibility of tying investment to participation, which is the root of an earlier form of securities exemption, the cooperative 
uh, business form that enabled a form of crowdfunding, but in the context of participation. And um, one thing I'm tracking a little bit right now is this uh, is, is some new apps that are trying to tie equity holding to a kind of consumer rewards model saying, you know, we'll treat you as kind of a special consumer if you can verify that you own stock in our company. And I'm curious about whether that might be something uh, that we should look for in the context of equity crowdfunding. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of companies I've worked with that have explored this, you know, they, they're seeing it as a marketing opportunity to try to align, you know, potential users uh, as investors. Uh, and, you know, and, and it also provides you, uh, investors with more direct interactions with the company, ways of validating and checking and, you know, just, just um, uh, uh, making the market less of a matter of, of kind of pure speculation but right. something that's grounded in, in direct economic relationships and, and also maybe direct personal relationships. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, think, uh, I think Professor Schwartz gets at this in a, in a number of different ways in the, the concept of, of the crowd funders being sort of brand ambassadors who are sometimes also just sort of enthusiastic users of the company's um, product. Um, and, and also something that was in the book new to me was um, the fact that there is a certain amount of sort of ongoing interaction with the company through video conferencing and shareholder meetings and, and, and things like that. Um, and, and, and I do think that that type of sort of practical knowledge about companies is um, probably more useful than um, say financial statements and, and maybe more useful than financial projections or promises or all the other things that you tend to find in regular disclosure. So, you know, I think to the extent that people, um, you know, have a, 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 an affinity and an involvement in, in the product and with the company, that that, that is a reason to, to view that as a kind of expertise that warrants some um, recognition in securities law, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is Professor Doug Cumming. Great. Okay, well, thanks uh, very much for the chance to join you. I uh, am in Florida, but I'm Canadian originally. Been in Florida the last five years. I'm very much indebted to Sophie and Robert, my two co-authors on this paper. Robert is a PhD student at FAU. A uh, great student to work with, and Sophia, I've done many projects together with her. In fact, I found her to be such a good co-author, I felt I needed to marry her. So that's <laughs> how that turned out. It's been a very successful partnership. Um, I uh, really enjoyed this uh, book and chance to join the forum. Um, uh, you know, the, there's many great quotes out of the book. I picked a few in order to motivate the particular paper here. So. Uh, in particular, the book starts out like, wow, you know, why would you ever do this? Information asymmetries are huge. The investments are very illiquid. It's right at the start of a company. So why would you ever do this? And we, we know that the crowd really wants this. So you think of some famous examples like Oculus Rift being financed through rewards crowdfunding on Kickstarter and sold to Facebook for over a billion. And of course, the crowd gets very angry that, you know, you can go to Vegas and bet 5,000 on uh, slot machines, but you can't put money in a startup. So that's, that's how it all got started. And with the rigorous analysis in the book, we come to this conclusion that, you know, there's potential great gains, lots of things that could be done right, but we need the right regulatory standards to make sure that it's successful. And over the years, so I've been writing papers on crowdfunding over the years, uh, actually for over a decade now. And normally we've been using data from places like Australia or Europe because they've had crowdfunding for way longer than we've had in the US. But now there's data available from the US. So that's what our goal is in this partic particular paper to see you know, exactly how effective are things going in the US. Does the market work in the way in which we would expect with the 
presumption that, you know, here we have information asymmetries, entrepreneurs are signaling information through their disclosures, and do those signals work in ways that we think are effective? And are there some limits to the regulation that's being put in place that inhibit the way it's done? And, and perhaps there's some regulatory requirements impo imposed on entrepreneurs kind of irrelevant to the crowd. And I'm gonna show you some things that, that we believe the data are telling us, uh, and I'll show you the evidence that we have to date. And this is a work in progress going through an R&R to journal. So very much welcome any comments or feedback. Um, what we have in the paper are some interesting governance mechanisms based on the data that we can obtain from the SEC webpage, over 4,000 campaigns. We believe we have 100% of the population from May 2016 to December 2021. So we started doing this in early 2022, and that's where we're at with the paper. It takes a while to go through the data. Now, when we examine the data, just, you know, the interesting things that come up that we wanted to know about was firstly, Delaware. So this is not a difficult sell to law students, but over the years, what, how the literature has progressed with Roberto Romano's original work in 1985, uh, showing the great benefits of a Delaware corporation when you reincorporate in Delaware, Publicly, company, publicly traded companies, their share value increases tremendously um, to work more in the 2000s that said, you know, this Delaware effect has kind of disappeared. Uh, uh, publicly traded firms have other ways to govern themselves and the marginal benefit of Delaware is essentially zero. Uh, and so what, what's interesting in the crowdfunding context is that we don't really have many other good governance mechanisms or things that we can use to signal to the crowd. And so maybe this is kind of relevant. And so th th there, there are a lot of papers that show uh, Delaware corporations are less subject to managerial entrenchment. It's easier to sue Delaware corporations. The judiciary is way more sophisticated in Delaware than other jurisdictions. And there's legal familiarity uh, so that everybody, even in Florida or Colorado, is taught Delaware law. Now, as I say this, I say this with a bit of trepidation because I was just on a road trip from Canada back to Florida, very long drive. So I started listening to Freakonomics podcasts. One of the podcasts said, Delaware is where all the evil corporations go and you don't need to disclose your identity. So I'm a bit on the fence as to the way I'm interpreting this. And I'd very much welcome your thought on that particular point. Secondly, we have these mandatory disclosures, two years of financials. So there's tremendous amount of data in the US that does not exist in other jurisdictions uh, with respect to income, assets, liabilities. And so we're gonna see if that matters. Uh, in the US, you don't only need to use common equity. You can use other things like SAFE, simple agreements for future equity, which is better, common or, or SAFE, or maybe debt or convertible debt, convertible deferred. You have all these different options and we have a prediction in the paper that common equity is best, and, and that's something that we could take a look at in the data. And then finally, there is a weird thing that's in the US which allows platforms to take an ownership stake in the companies in which they invest. And, or sorry, not invest, an ownership stake in the companies in which they list. And you can imagine there's all sorts of conflict, potential conflicts of interest that they over promote those companies at the expense of others. And so for me, that was a bit of a weird one. Um, and we wanted to see if that was potentially relevant as well. So that's what we really focus on. We have many other variables in the data, but you know, I've just a very short amount of time in a different forum. I'd give you another 10 slides on each of these points, but let's go to the data. So the data, as I told you from the SEC, uh, we even created a, page uh, with uh, Robert. He is good at doing these kind of things. We have a crowdfunding tracker on the FAU webpage that's of interest. I could just show you a few of the slides. Uh, we saw some similar ones today. So on a quarterly basis, the amounts raised, uh, number of campaigns. Uh, so it's a market that's growing large and arguably could grow 
larger if it enjoyed the freedoms of, say, New Zealand, which is always a very big puzzle because it's one of, you know, where a place where there's more sheep than people, yet it has this very successful, one of the more successful crowdfunding markets in the world on a per capita basis. So there's certainly room to grow. The evidence of the room to grow is very much highlighted by the May 20, uh, May 2021 change that restricted campaigns to raising only a million dollars. So, which is, as a Canadian, I found that very puzzling. You know, the land of the free, but no, you can only raise a million dollars. And so they changed it to uh, 5 million in May of 2021. It's just massive increase in capital raises. So arguably 5 million is also pretty small. Um, but I guess, you know, securities regulators are risk averse. And if there's a major crisis that happens, then people lose jobs and that's, uh, you know, how, how things go, but that's, that's notable. Um, I like this map because uh, it shows some regional differences and, you know, some fun things happened during COVID. What, one of which I noticed in Florida is that everybody moved to Florida and crowdfunding took off like crazy, which, which I appreciate a lot because my house price doubled in value over a couple of months, you know. Uh, and then other places like Idaho have benefited tremendously by the population shifts. Um, if you want to see this on this graph, the, the Florida one is the sort of turquoise color, uh, became second for a little while and when, when COVID hit. And, and COVID has been uh, showing the real great benefits of crowdfunding, that uh, crowdfunding, uh, that's one way more resilient in a crisis than traditional bank loans, for example. And then here's the Delaware slide. So Delaware has an enormous uh, bump up in success chances. So just on each of these quarters, and two of them, they're equal. Uh, and then the very first one, there's a difference. But the, the dark blue is the Delaware Incorporated ones compared to the others. Now, uh, if you, someone asked me about this uh, this morning, do you, or actually last night at dinner, do you have data on platforms? And yeah, WeFunders, the, the uh, most successful with the largest amounts raised. Uh, there's some differences in success rate. The U.S. goes by an all or nothing rule. So if you set your campaign goal, if you don't meet it, then you don't get the money that you raise. Now, we do a few things in the data, and I know I'm out of time in about 10 seconds. Uh, uh, so I will just say there's a lot of statistics in the data. I'm not going to trouble you with the small font in general, uh, but the perhaps one thing that I could just do is uh, tell you a few things. So Delaware companies raise about 66,000 more on average, controlling for other things being equal in a regression setup. Common equity raises are roughly 60,000 to 109,000 more on average. Um, but the interesting part of this is, you know, we require all these t financial disclosures for two years. It does not matter which way you cut the data. It appears that nobody cares. Like, so, so literally, uh, there's no predictive ability from financial statement disclosures. Uh, uh, by contrast, market conditions matter a lot. Delaware corporations matter a lot. Firm age also matters. The type of security that you uh, put in matters. And that post-SEC regulatory change matters. Um, uh, and I give some statistics there. But let me, let me just, uh, you know, focus on this last one. So those two significant events that are kind of interesting, the, this regulatory change, May 2021, 20, uh, uh, it bumped up just for that rest of 2021, because our data end at the end of 2021. So it, it raises capital by an increase on a percentage basis of 260%. And then the other is that, hey, we like things, new solutions that help us out in a crisis. And uh, we published this in a different paper, but you look at bank loans that just died in the crisis. You know, and then FinTech solutions did extremely well in the crisis. So probability of success uh, even went higher during the crisis period. So um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Excellent book. Congratulations. Thank you.
Can I take some questions? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm, yeah, oh, and if anyone has thoughts on Delroy, I don't know if you've seen the Free Economic Podcast, but now I'm like, Wondering if I got it all wrong, is Delaware evil or is it good? You know, and maybe the Delaware thing is a bit of a red herring. I don't know. So I'd love you know, the collect. I'd love to crowdsource the ideas for that. <laughs> um, so thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have any data on other firm performance? Uh, maybe this is a longitudinal effort, but I'm thinking that their future fundraising efforts from institutional investors. Uh, all the way to their ultimate success. Yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, I'd love to come back 10 years from now and have more information on these companies. You know, what did they do? And so our, our measures of success are extremely short term, just with the campaign success. So we'd like to know, did they get follow on venture capital? Did they, um, uh, you know, get an IPO perhaps? Uh, and so not with the USA because the history is so short and the runway is so long, we can't say much about that with US data. We say a little bit about that with other country data. So one of the better crowdfunding platforms in the world is one from Israel called Our Crowd. And they've had some great successes. Like uh, my favorite one, I do this in the classes. I have a class on, the, on crowdfunding, in fact. And I always bring up uh, Rewalk. So if you're, if you're, uh, uh, you know, board tonight, uh, just Google rewalk crowdfunding, and you see people with an exoskeleton that are, you know, quadriplegic or paraplegic, and they can now walk a marathon. And so it almost brings tears to your eyes. And that's a crowdfunding company that went public on NASDAQ about 18 months after crowdfunding. And many other good examples like that. So the international data, while small, because even 10 years of history is not, a, not really enough, uh, but it suggests that, you know, people that say only bad companies that use crowdfunding are really quite mistaken. Uh, there's some great examples uh, from different places around the world. The, the largest market in the world is the, the one in the UK. Crowdcube is the biggest platform in the world. And they, too, have some uh, good success stories. Uh, but, yeah, it's uh, so, you know, I would say... Uh, more data, more time. Uh, someone might come here 50 years from now and say, wow, those guys are crazy. But I think all signs are pointing to the fact that that is going to be uh, great things uh, with this market moving forward. I, actually, maybe just one last final thing on that is that fraud rates. So we published last year a paper on crowdfunding fraud. Fraud is a percentage of publicly traded companies. The fraud rates Detected are about three to five percent. Undetected, possibly as high as fifteen percent, depending on which paper you look at. And then in crowdfunding, the detected fraud rates appear to be way lower, even with rewards crowdfunding. So again, maybe more time is needed to flush that out. But so far, it appears that the wisdom of the crowd is quite quite savvy and not funding bad campaigns. There's one. Um, I, uh, I apologize if you're the wrong person to be asking this question, but I'm wondering if anybody on the panel or the audience uh, has uh, thought about the use of uh, non-fungible tokens as a medium to transact uh, uh, the democratization of, of uh, finance. I, I can say very briefly uh, that I know a little bit about it and that in some contexts that those are uh, very successful new financial tools with the caveat that the volatility in that area is so large that that's problematic. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, for the regular person, that's uh, not, not, not exactly the best way to go. Perhaps others would like to comment on that. I'm going to talk about Uh, thanks. Really interesting information. I am actually on the board of a company that's about to do a crowdfunding raise. And I don't actually know yet, what are the basic transactional costs to the company? Like how much do they end up having to pay? And yeah. looks like you would know that. 
Yeah. And then I'm also interested, I feel bad saying I think there's a we funded person here, but the CEO texted me the other day and said, we're switching from we funder to start engine. Oh. Are there significant differences between the platforms and advantages of the different platforms? So I, um, uh, different platforms do different uh, amounts of due diligence. Um, uh, you know, if you wanted a quick and dirty synopsis, uh, WeFunder has raised a bit more in total than Start Engine. Their success rates on the two places are quite similar. 65 and 72% is uh, not going to be a statistically significant difference. Um, uh, as between the two, uh, you know, I would encourage you to go and check that out more carefully. Now, the, I forget precisely the fees on these two particular platforms, but often in the U.S. they have a 5% rule. So 5% of the amount raised goes to the platform. And you might go, oh, that's bad. But when you think of, say, taking a company public, there's a common thing that the largest capital raises you know, the, the investment banks are charging 7%. And then for smaller IPOs, that's even a much higher percentage of the capital raise. So 5% isn't so bad. It's not that everybody charges 5%. There's a lot of variability. Um, and we have actually all the, the percentages charged and the details and the data. So if you ever needed that information, you can fire me an email and I could let you know. Uh, uh, but yeah, the, all that, all that, all this information is publicly available, and so I'm happy to share it with you if you want to ask me anything further. Okay. With that, we're going to move to the next speaker, and thank you very much, Doug. Thank you. Our final speaker is Professor Yao Kong. Okay. Um, thank you for um, inviting me. Some shorts. Um, and so really online crowdfunding campaigns um, have um, become more common and uh, the question arises is how does tax relate to this uh, phenomenon? And in his book, uh, Professor Schwartz uh, is saying that when he compares the investment crowdfunding activity in the US and other countries like Australia, um, he theorizes that perhaps the fact that the UK um, has special tax benefits that are not specific to crowdfunding um, could be the reason for the discrepancy of why uh, the numbers in other countries are higher um, than when compared to the US. So having that claim in mind, I delve into this uh, uh, comparison and looked at the UK and the US, and the US uh, tax treatment of investment crowdfunding. So, at the um, entity level, funds that are raised um, in the UK from crowdfunding are usually not taxable if they're exchanged solely for um, um, equity in the company. Um, um, there are also some um, R&D credits and uh, incentives. For example, um, if, you, um, if the company is um, uh, invest in qualifying research um, expenditures. They can get up to 33% uh, of that amount um, as a write-off. Uh, but really what I wanted to focus on are tax incentives for investors. Um, so the UK has four schemes to help small and medium um, companies grow by attracting investments uh, um, through offering tax reliefs to individuals. The Enterprise Investment Scheme, the EIS, the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, the SEIS, the Social Investment Tax Relief, which uh, became ineffective this year, and the Venture Capitalist Trust. Um, and really, I'm going to focus on the uh, top two. Um, but just so you know, the, there are four or more like three uh, uh, main schemes. Um, so starting with that, the incentives have a lot of limitations for exactly on industry. So um, legal or financial services is not qualified, property development, running a hotel, banking insurance, debt, or financing services, these are not um, eligible for these benefits. There are limits on the investment amounts. Um, so the maximum amount that you can raise in a lifetime in a company uh, for EIS um, and venture capital uh, trust, the fee, VC uh, T investments, 12 million pounds. And for the SEIS, 20, uh, 250,000 pounds. So these are the limits. 
Uh, and if you look at the EIS program, launched in 1994, uh, uh, it makes investing in shares in early stage businesses more attractive through tax relief. Um, and again, there are um, limitations and qualifications that you have to, um, to uh, abide by. Uh, so for example, there uh, could be a company qualification, could be no more than 50 million pounds in gross assets, less than 250 employees, um, and have active sales of not more than seven years for the EIS and the VCT programs. Uh, but really, um, what they're offering are four types of tax relief. The first one is income tax relief. So investors can claim up to 30% of their qualifying investments uh, to reduce their taxes. So if you put in a million dollars, you can get up to 300 million, sorry, pounds. If you put a, a million pounds, you can get up to 300,000 um, uh, pounds as a deduction for, against your income. Uh, it's a tax-free growth uh, um, uh, platform, so if, when investors sell their EIS shares, uh, the growth in value from the investment is usually tax-free, and this is quite significant because usually small and medium firms have a high potential of growth. Uh, the capital gains can be deferred, so when an, um, uh, you have a gain made from sales of other assets, not EIS sales, you can reinvest them in EIS shares and defer them over the uh, life of the investment, and there's no upper limit for that. Uh, and there's also loss relief. So loss is deductible against ordinary income, and that reduces the impact of the losses when you have EIS companies that are not successful. The SEIS program, um, the seed enterprise investment scheme is very similar, uh, but it qualifies for firms that, that are active less than two years, um, and they have no more than 350,000 pounds in gross assets, less than 25 employees, and haven't been previously carried any other trade. Um, and if you invest in SEIS, you can claim up to 50% of the investments and exempt on any capital gain tax. Um, just to note that to be able to claim these tax benefits, the UK tax authorities need to send a letter of authorization, a unique reference number, and a compliance certificate. So it has to be uh, done with a lot of collaboration with the company and the investors. So let's explore what's going on in the US. Um, with the entity taxation, Again, funds raised are not considered income. Um, there was a question about cryptocurrency. Uh, so property, um, including cryptocurrency, exchanged solely for um, equity, could be tax-free capital contributions under Section 351 and 1032 under specific requirements. Uh, but if there are rewards involved, the code ex explicitly states uh, explicitly states that if investors receive reward throughout crowdfunding whatsoever, uh, as, uh, aside from the equity, these are taxable gains. So at the entity level, there are also federal and state R&D tax credits. For example, section 41 provides a dollar for dollar uh, tax incentive for the companies uh, against their tax, taxable income, I'm sorry, tax, yeah, against their tax bill, it's a credit. So it's a dollar for dollar at the end of the process. And at the state level, we have 38 states that provide R&D uh, tax credits, uh, similar to the federal level. Um, and there's really interesting stuff at the state level. For example, I found that Pennsylvania had the um, innovation zone tax credit that provides credits for companies that are less than eight years old, uh, that specifically invest in uh, keystone areas around universities and nonprofit um, organizations, kind of like uh, uh, um, trying to mimic Silicon Valley. Uh, you can get um, really generous, um, there's a, a $15 million pool of uh, a tax credit that you can use to claim up to 50% of the increase in your portfolio companies. Um, what other tax incentives, though, do they provide in the U.S. to investors? Uh, because that's really uh, the gist of maybe the reason why the U.K. Uh, crowdfunding and the U.S. crowdfunding is so different. 
So here, um, as I emailed uh, um, Professor Schwartz when he uh, pitched this idea to me, I thought, well, we do have um, tax incentives in the US for small businesses, and I wonder how that would apply to crowdfunding. So for example, uh, for small business stock, defined as a C corporation with assets of less than $50 million, and you heard correctly, $50 million doesn't sound very small, and I've written about how small is not really small uh, and why. Uh, we have three main vehicles that are very much like the UK uh, um, tax incentives. We have section uh, 1244 that provides uh, reporting capital losses for small business stock as ordinary losses, up to $50 million if you're a single filer, $100,000 if you're a joint filer, uh, Section 1202 provides 50 to 100 percent exclusion, depending on what year we're talking about, who's the president at the time, uh, uh, from gain in small business stock, held for five years uh, or more, and um, <coughs> provides you that exclusion, uh, kind of like the um, tax-free growth in the UK. And when you sell the stock, Stock sales could be eligible for 1045, Section 1045 rollover of gain uh, if you invest within 60 days in another small business uh, stock. So um, very similar to what we have in the UK, in looking at the state tax benefits, um, we do have angel tax credits. Over 31 states uh, provide um, angel tax credits that attract investors. Uh, they are mostly uh, refundable. Um, tax credits against your income and then some, and they are available to accredited investors to use against their business or corporate income tax liability. But again, it requires a lot of collaborations uh, and needs to be certified by the state ex ante, but needs to be done after the deal is complete. Um, and that's something I'm going to talk about in terms of what, what can we do better. Um, there's something really cool that I Notice in Colorado, for example, we used to have, uh, we, you guys, used to have in 2010, um, the Colorado Innovation Investment Tax Credit that actually sunsetted the, day, the year afterwards, that provided um, a specific percentage of the investment against state income tax liability. Uh, it permitted um, equity investment in specifically qualified small business in aerospace, bioscience, clean energy on uh, information technology industry um, to get that uh, dollar for dollar reduction, but that sunset in 2011, uh, and, but was replaced with the advanced industry investment tax credit that really limited to areas of enterprise zone in Colorado. So more geographical rather than industry wise. Um, the only thing that I found that specifically um, relates to crowdfunding is in Virginia. And Virginia has qualified equity and subordinated debt investment tax credit. This is a long way uh, to say that really it provides um, crowdfunding companies and it specifically mentions uh, crowdfunding. Uh, in 2013, uh, it was enacted. It provides up to $50,000 of income tax credit equal to 50% of the investments, qualified investments in um, transactions via online general solicitation, online broker, or funding porter, i.e. crowdfunding platforms. Um, what is a qualified business? Has gross um, uh, revenues of no more than $3 million, principal business in Virginia, um, also established primarily uh, production in Virginia, and so on and so forth. It's a grant-like credit, meaning you have to apply, there's a cap, and if, so, if there are more applicants than what is available, they reduce it and they allocate it. Um, and you can carry it over for the next 15 years if you're not using it at that year. So just to summarize, what are the issues with what I've seen so far? First of all, complexity, because it could be that we're offering the same thing in the US and the UK, but somehow the way that we administer it here makes it more challenging. Um, so investors need to establish that the corporate level requirements are satisfied, uh, mostly when you look at gross assets test, qualified trader business, um, and redemption rules. Um, and so for example, to qualify for any tax write-offs, 
all three sections, 1202, 1045, and 1244, you have to hold actual equity investments, common stock. So uh, Professor Cummins um, note about the type of equity. It cannot be um, safes, for example. So um, any type of convertible shares are not um, uh, qualified. It has to be common or preferred. Uh, what happens if you have convertible to common and preferred? Then only when it converted, you can claim that benefit. There's a lot of uncertainty. So tax rates require, require both firm and investor to um, collaborate and to uh, get sometimes certification from states um, as eligible for the credit, but at, um, again, only when the deal is complete uh, and it requires a lot of collaboration. There's tax salience in, anything, in everything, but specifically here, um, um, there are a lot of significant challenges that even when you have a VC-backed startup, um, people don't really pay attention to tax until it's after the fact and they have to go back and their accountants are looking at numbers and, and agreements and try to make sense of how to get those benefits. And there are agency problems that Professor Schwartz uh, wrote in his book and I reiterate here, when you have small investors, they do not really have a lot of influence on crowdfunding companies uh, to oblige them and to nudge them to satisfy the necessary requirements to get them to um, benefit from the rules. So I'll finish with some recommendations of what I think we can do to improve the situation. I think the IRS should adopt clear guidance regarding crowdfunding tax incentives, uh, because right now, as I said, it's general small business qualifying stock. It's not uh, crowdfunding uh, uh, specifically. Uh, legislated like Congress should uh, enact safe harbor rules for investors in crowdfunding, uh, so taxpayers can follow basic instructions, rest easy knowing that their crowdfunding investments will qualify for the tax benefits, uh, and to save on, on agency and administrative costs, both investors and the IRS uh, um, um, could look into crowdfunding companies and platforms to issue uh, advanced tax assurances, like representations, tax statements that reflect the company's fulfillment of uh, qualifications for various tax positions to clarify for potential investors and even draw them by saying, hey, these are the tax consequences uh, of these specific crowdfunding grants and that is before you make the investment and you come more um, knowledgeable to that um, investment. So again, I wanna reiterate um, my appreciation to Professor Schwartz, to Brad, to uh, um, Christine, um, uh, to Ed, all the organizers for uh, making this event successful and for the opportunity to work on this interesting uh, project. And I welcome your comments and thoughts. We have one up here. Yeah, um, I, so I. Uh, feel like I read somewhere along the way that one criticism of the various state schemes to provide tax credits to angel investors is that there's a strong sense that those investors don't really optimize for tax. So the, so the tax credits aren't really pivotal in the decision whether to invest or not. They're just kind of a freebie on the back end. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether you think that same concern could apply to the crowd? Um, I actually think that the crowd um, is different. And I'm writing a paper now on R&D credits generally. And I think you basically reward the rewardee because they're going to do the R&D credit, the R&D uh, investment to begin with. And I've worked with accountants that uh, specifically uh, uh, fix the numbers or present them so that it, they would get the, the R&D credits, and you're right. They're, it's just a lollipop you get at the end of the year for doing what you're doing anyway. Uh, I think in crowdfunding, though, because you put it out there, um, and it's, you make this salient, and you're thinking, huh, I may have a positive income uh, liability, tax liability this year. I might be able to claim this, or this is a sweet uh, um, uh, portion of the deal that I haven't thought of, that could actually be, if you put any ex ante, that could actually be different from the R&D credits and the uh, um, uh, angel investment credits. 
Yeah, uh, parallel questions. As a U.S. resident, can I invest in U.K.? Crowdfunding, and the parallel question is, as a company, a U.S. company, can I seek uh, crowdfunding in the, in the U.K.? You could, but if you're asking about your um, tax credits, it's usually for domestic, for, if, for, certainly for the state tax credits, and for the U.S., it needs to be a domestic company. Yeah, so um, from the entity perspective, they can still benefit from the entity tax level incentives. Uh, and then the foreign investor cannot, um, well, let's put it this way. It's, it's complicated because you have to file coordination tax uh, uh, reports that coordinate between the foreign tax credit uh, um, and the um, credits that are offered federally. It is doable, but very complex. If the company is, is domestic and we have a foreign investor that has positive tax liability in the U.S. Some more questions? Well, thank you very much. Sure. It's a terrific uh, presentation. And can we have one more round of applause for all of our speakers? Thank you.